Hi, and welcome to Pop-Up Magazine. I'm Anita Bottajo. And I'm Anna Martin. If you've been to one of our live shows before, you know that each season we travel to big, beautiful theaters across the country with writers, filmmakers, photographers, radio producers, comedians. For obvious reasons, we couldn't do that this spring. So we decided to come home. For the first time ever, we're presenting an online version of Pop-Up Magazine. We thought a lot about what makes our show unique and put it all in this video. Incredible storytelling, beautiful artwork, and original music by our house band, Magic Magic Orchestra. The biggest change is, instead of all being in the same room together, you can watch this show from anywhere. Turns out you can also host this show from anywhere. I'm in DC. And I'm in London. I'm on my parents' back porch. And I'm in my boyfriend's living room. I finally showered for this. And I, wait, what? Don't worry about it. We can just, we can move on. Okay. Our shows are always a team effort, and this one especially. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Google, who helped make all of this possible. So many things have changed, but one thing remains the same. We made this just for you. All right, Anita, I feel like it's time to get started. Let's do it. Enjoy the show. Since being stuck at home, there are a lot of things I miss. Like, I don't know, let me think. Um, everything. I, I miss everything. But I will say I'm trying to stay positive and just between us, there are a few things that uh, I don't really miss. Here are a few of them. Oh, starting with. Not being sure whether to go in for a handshake, a hug, or a kiss on the cheek when you meet an acquaintance. Hey, <laughs> come here. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, and, uh, and a, a kiss, a, a kiss for the gracious host. And it's gone. Where, uh, where is the alcohol here? When you get caught singing in your car, and then you hit a red light. Summertime, summer go, summer, oh, so, summertime, summer, summertime. <clears throat> I had a cop. It's the longest light in town. <laughs> oh. Going to a bachelorette party where the only person you know is the bride. Woo, let's grow. <laughs> uh, oh, what's that? What's that chant? Oh, uh, the we are the girl. I I don't know. I don't know it. No, you guys go. Uh, no, sorority sisters. Nice. Yeah. No, we are. We're uh, friends from from middle school. Yeah. Old, <laughs> old, old friends. Um. <clears throat> Shots. Splitting the bill with a big group at a restaurant. Oh, uh, I actually, I actually just got the the cup of soup. We're gonna split it evenly. Sixty, sixty dollars. Okay, yeah, just uh, just put that right on my card. When someone says hi to you at a party and you have no idea who they are. Hey, you? <laughs> Where the heck have you been? <laughs> uh, what's going? What's going on with your? With, and your with your apart? You have the apartment. You live with? You have? You live with? The, the, in the place. I love it. <laughs> it's been, I, it's been ages. I, I'm getting a page. My pager's buzz buzzing in the other room. I'd love to stay and chat, big guy. <laughs> okay, say hi to the, say hi to the apartment. When you get out of the elevator at your office, say goodbye to your coworker and then realize you're both going in the same direction. <laughs> well, that's a conversation we're gonna have to have with the boss on Monday, Larry. <laughs> you have a great weekend now. Uh, you're going, you are going this way too. Oh, I didn't, I thought you were going, okay. <laughs> uh, small world. <laughs> so what are you, what are you gonna eat, eat this weekend? Opening a weird gift in front of people. Okay, okay, who's this one from? Who's, Sophie? Okay, here we go. Sophie, it is a stapler. It's, it's, this is a stapler. It is wonderful. Thank you so much, Sophie. When you host a dinner party and the last guest won't leave. <laughs> right, right, because it was Georgia, the state, not the country. Right, yeah. Okay, well, so nice having you. Thank you so much again for, I, I think I've heard that one too, yeah. But I, 
<laughs> right, well, okay. I'll, yep. <laughs> right. Oh no, it's getting late. Well, no, I'm not wearing a watch, but if I was, it would tell me it was late. Okay, thank you for coming. We'll see you soon. <laughs> I've heard that one too. I have heard that one too. Bye bye. Bye bye. In all seriousness, I literally can't wait to have a dinner party again. You can stay as long as you'd like. Before I graduated college, like many English majors before me, I realized I had no idea what I was going to do with my degree. So I panic googled the saddest three-word story ever told, creative writing jobs. Greeting card editor sounds like a fake job title, but for the first five years of my professional life, that's what I was. I found hope and health benefits and an actual use for my degree as the humor card editor at Hallmark in Kansas City, Missouri. The little I knew about greeting card writers came from 500 Days of Summer. That's the movie where Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Zoe Deschanel work at a greeting card company and they fall in and out of love. Hallmark was not like that. It was a very big, very old corporation. Many of my coworkers had been at the company longer than I'd been alive. I never experienced a meet cute in an elevator, although one time while riding up to the seventh floor, my boss pointed at me and another Asian woman and said, oh, is this your sister? As a humor card editor, I regularly had meetings where project managers in dress pants said things like, in the Father's Day category, fart jokes seemed to be outperforming jokes about bacon. I had an Excel spreadsheet titled Christmas Cards with Dog Puns, an analysis. I even posed as a greeting card model once. In my five years, I helped write thousands of cards, but the best parts of my days were spent reviewing new card ideas. Just like any other joke, a funny greeting card has a setup and a punchline. We'd often go back to the tried and true blank is like blank setup. Friendships are like wine, they get better with age. Sisters are like coffee, good for a pick me up and sometimes kind of bitter. Or we'd fall back on the joke formula that never fails, cats and funny hats. Maybe one out of every 10 ideas was actually turned into a card. The rest either didn't land, were too similar to something that already existed, or became part of a special group of rejects lovingly dubbed funny but no. As in, this is funny but literally no one will pay money to buy it. For example, we all want you to have a happy birthday because we all know how you get. Mom, I want to take Mother's Day to say I love you. Also, everyone can see everything you do on Facebook. It's all very public. You need to stop. Happy Valentine's Day to the one I love the most. Tom Hanks. If you see him, please give him this card. Getting a funny but no was a badge of honor. We spent most our days working on cards that were saccharine and formulaic, so it felt really good to write something silly and stupid, or something that shared how I actually felt. I've been away from Hallmark for four years, but I still think of new card ideas every once in a while. I spent a lot of time working on cards for the big stuff. Birthdays, holidays, sorry I forgot our anniversary. But there are a lot of little moments when I could use one. For example, to my ex's girlfriend's cousin, my deepest condolences on accidentally liking your Instagram post from three years ago. Please respect my privacy during this time. To my middle school self, good things come to those who wait. But only if you stop giving yourself bangs. To the person who emailed me after reading something I wrote about smartphones. Heard you were sick of entitled 20-somethings. Get well soon. Greeting cards might seem old-timey, maybe even a little irrelevant, but I'm trying to find small moments to celebrate, like putting on pants with a zipper. There should be a card for that.
almost nine months pregnant, she bought a yucca plant. She found a corner of her apartment that felt right for it, watered it, and talked to it. But pretty quickly, things took a turn for the worse. If you've ever taken care of houseplants, maybe you know this part. It started to die. How is it that I'm so good at taking care of this child who's about to come into the world, but I'm so bad at taking care of this one little plant? That really shouldn't be that complicated. I hear stories like this a lot. My background is in engineering, and over the years, I've gotten pretty interested in the mechanics of plants, why they thrive, why they don't. Before long, I became the houseplant guy. People reach out to me with a lot of questions. Did I water too much? Did I not water enough? Does my apartment get enough sunlight? Maybe I should move it somewhere else. The questions start about the environment, but slowly, they turn inward. Maybe. I'm just not good enough. I think it's very tempting to see a plant as kind of a testing ground for who you are as a person. There's something really beautiful in being able to, to help something live, and not just live, but thrive. Dwayne is a comedian. Let me tell my dog shut up real quick. Fredo, be quiet! <laughs> Shh, I'm recording. When he started his first late night TV writing gig, his boss got everyone on the team a plant. He took it as a test. If he wasn't able to take care of it, he thought people wouldn't take him seriously. It died within a week. Uh, but there was one writer who did not start until two weeks later. So one day I was walking by his office, his empty office that had a plant on the desk. And I was like, you know what, I'ma just steal this plant. Dwayne switched his dead plant with the living one. So when the new writer started, everyone assumed it died because no one was there to water it. For the new guy, it was no harm, no foul. But for Dwayne, it was a second chance. So then I think I watered it like once a week that Friday before I left the office. Then I come back that Monday and be like, what up, plant? Because I named it Plant. It became a companion to him. The job was very hard, so I would talk to it sometimes. I had a joke because I was the, the only person of color. I was like, this is the other person of color because it's green. When the show's season wrapped, Dwayne took the plant home. As his career took off, it flourished. And when he closed his chapter in New York and moved to LA, he left it behind. Cengiz Yar is a photographer. A few years ago, he headed to northern Iraq to document conflict in the region. He witnessed the human toll of battle up close. Most nights, after interviewing refugees and spending time on the front lines, Cengiz would head home to the large yellow house he rented with other journalists. In the courtyard uh, for this house, uh, there was like a big plot of kind of like dirt when we moved in, uh, and there was burnt grass. Like you'd walk outside if you didn't have shoes on and the grass would poke your feet. It was like really hard and just like awful earth. His roommates didn't seem to notice or care, but he saw potential. I went to like the bazaar and I found a, a plant shop and I bought some seeds and I bought a little sprinkler. He raked the brittle earth. He added water. Not too much, but just enough. Next, the grass seeds. Uh, and then eventually the grass started to grow. And the grass was really nice and green and fresh and I could take my shoes off and, and socks off and walk through the yard without wincing. And then eventually I had to get a lawnmower because the grass grew so much. The tiny yard became a spot for the roommates to gather. It was a patch of peace amid chaos. And it was like mine. Um, I had. Like, I made it, and I might not own the dirt it was on, but like, I made this thing happen, um, and it was mine. When I hear people's stories, I find common threads. We're all connected by the goal to preserve life and encourage it, especially when the world surrounding it is hard. And we can be tough on ourselves when things don't work out. 
But maybe if we think about plants differently, we'll start thinking of ourselves differently too. Imperfect, complicated, subject to our environment, in need of love. Carla's yucca plant didn't make it after she gave birth, but she kept at it, and now she's got full house. The visitor coming. Say hi. Hello. She has lots of plants just like we do. Often perform at colleges, and for the most part, these shows tend to go well. Last January at Washington State University was not one of those times. The students were promised extra credit to attend, and the only time they laughed was when I said, I'm taking a Greyhound bus back home to Portland tomorrow, and when the bus crashes, it will not be the worst thing that happened this week. This is much worse. The next morning, I headed to the station and boarded my bus. When I looked up, I saw two men in green uniforms walking down the aisle. One of them approached me and asked for ID. I handed him my driver's license. He looked at it and asked if I was a citizen. I said no. He asked for my passport. I told him I did not have it, but I had my employment authorization. And that's when he told me to follow him off the bus. Standing on the curb, I saw two other men who had also been pulled off. One was speaking Spanish. I realized the men in the uniforms must be from ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And they hadn't asked everyone on the bus for their documents, no. They assumed I wasn't from here. They saw me and were like, this guy looks too handsome to be from Spokane, Washington. And they were right. I came to the US from Libya in 2014 on a student visa. A month after I got here, things got pretty bad back home. I had been an interpreter for American journalists and US Embassy, so the extremist militias assumed I was an undercover agent, which I took as a compliment. I'm glad they think I'm that smart, I'll take validation from anyone. But it wasn't safe for me to go back, so I applied for political asylum. And after four years of forms and interviews and background checks, my asylum was finally granted. One officer took my documents and stepped few feet away. He read my immigration number into his radio. After some back and forth, I heard him say, okay, so it's, it's in the system. And I was like, oh good, I'm, I'm glad we figured this one out. Then he came back to where I was standing and said, yeah, so I just checked and there is no record of your asylum anywhere in the system. I'd never been questioned like I was a criminal before. Good thing is I've done my research, and by that I mean I've watched every season of Law and Order. It turns out saying your Seventh Amendment rights are being violated when you have no idea what the Seventh Amendment says doesn't really work. The officers just got more pissed. I looked over at the Spanish-speaking men next to me, and they were just going at him with questions, and no one was translating. The officers huddled together, then one came up to me and said, we're gonna let you go this time. I practically ran back to the bus. As we pulled away, I looked out of the window. The officers were putting the Spanish speaking men into the back of their van. At this point, I was both furious and confused. So I started Googling. I learned the green uniforms meant the officers did not work for ICE, but Customs and Border Patrol. Federal law allows Border Patrol to conduct sweeps at any transportation hub within 100 miles off the border. This zone covers some of the densest cities in the country, two-thirds of the U.S. population. Spokane was just at the edge of that zone, about 90 miles from Canada, and notorious for these kind of searches. Which is fascinating that these agents think someone would want to leave Canada to come here. I also learned that Greyhound did not have to let Border Patrol on their buses. They were a private company and could say no. Eventually, my story made national news, which meant I got to hear my name mispronounced a lot. Meanwhile, I had constant nightmares. 
nerves about being deported. I stopped leaving the house and canceled my shows. The worst part was that now the whole country knew that I was traveling around on Greyhound buses, which is not good for my brand. One day, I got a call from the ACLU and the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. They explained that they've been fighting for years to stop border patrol sweeps and offered to take on my case. My first reaction was, no way, we're, we're not gonna do that. But then I thought back to my panic that day and to the other man who was put in the back of the van. So this February, I filed a federal lawsuit against border patrol. Just few days after I filed, Greyhound released a statement ending its practice of allowing Border Patrol onto their buses. When I tweeted about this whole experience, hundreds of people said that if they had been on that bus, they would have defended me. But when I got back to my seat, not a single person looked me in the eye or asked me what happened outside. People were just upset because now we were late. I have never felt lonelier or more out of place than when I got back on that bus. And I'm saying that as someone who has been to an Ariana Grande concert as an adult. I still get messages on social media about the whole thing. A lot are from people cheering my case on, but some condemn me for suing Border Patrol. They're saying that I'm being ungrateful and that if I don't like it here, I should just go home. My answer to those messages is always the same. I am home. Jolly, are you okay? Liz, are you awake? Torso forward. Check pulse. Check pulse. Shift weight. Shift weight. Slow breath. Slow breath. Uncurl. Uncurl. Close eyes. Stand. 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 Being still. Listening. Being still, forgiving. Being still, noticing. Being still, remembering. Being still, dreaming. Being still, being still. I was a teenager when I first met Miss Pat. Miss Pat was a preschool teacher, and watching her connect with her students was magical for me. She didn't tell her kids what to do. She was a partner in their learning. And now we're all partners in that learning in ways we never imagined before. Though I miss being in my classroom, I'm thankful for the tools and technology that continue to allow me to connect with my students and their families every day. As the new National Teacher of the Year, I am here to tell all parents. Give yourself some credit. Relax and focus on what's most important, spending meaningful time with your children. We will get everybody caught up. We will connect even better than we did before. Until then, let this film from Google assure you, you are not alone. Four plus one is Um, how many pints of iced tea are left in the pizza? I'm so scared in case I fall off my chair. So, wait. You want to show us the continent of the now? It's not going good. My mom is getting stressed out. Is the big deal chilling? Mom is tired. I, I, like. <laughs> so, starting just quickly by breathing in. Please. 
never thought I'd say this, but I kind of miss school. <laughs> Teachers, I mean, y'all the gift to people. I thank you so much for what you're doing. Their investment into our children is beyond what we can even imagine. Appreciate all that you do. One late March day in New York City, a medical student named Allison put flowers in her hair. It was match day, the day every med student in the US opens a letter that tells them where they'll be spending their residency and the next few years of their life. Usually it's a time of celebration, surrounded by family and friends. But these weren't ordinary times. Match day ceremonies across the country had been canceled, so Allison came up with a different plan. Me and a couple of my med school friends decided that what we would do is go up onto the roof of our building and spread out on the roof six feet apart from one another with a couple of bottles of champagne, open our emails alone but together. Allison matched at her top choice. She was thrilled, but sad too. It was nice to be around others, but I'll tell you, the hardest part of it was having no one to hug. While Allison and her friends were on that roof, I was gearing up for a stretch of hospital shifts. I'm a doctor in San Francisco and the creator of The Nocturnus, a live show and podcast where healthcare workers share stories about their lives in medicine. When the coronavirus hit, we invited our audience to send us audio diaries about their experience. We heard from over 200 people, doctors, nurses, hospital administrators. That's how I met Allison. Wow, guys. I am sitting at my kitchen table right now and I'm in complete shock. I feel like my heart is in my feet and my face has gone all red and my heart is beating out of my chest. Since the pandemic began, hundreds of fourth year med students have been asked if they would graduate early and go straight to work. Allison was one of them. So it's looking like I might be going from med student to doctor in just over a week, which is completely mind blowing. Several days later, Allison and about 50 other students stumbled through the Hippocratic Oath together on a video call. That morning, Allison had walked to the East River. She wanted to write a letter to her mom, who died from lung cancer a year and a half ago. She had also been a doctor. I have this tradition of writing her letters when big things happen in my life, and this certainly felt like a big thing. I sat there in drizzling rain, and I wrote her a letter about where the world is right now and what it means for me to be graduating. and. Then I came home and I sat on my couch and turned on my computer and became a doctor. Before she became a doctor, Allison had already seen how the pandemic was changing things. She had been volunteering at the hospital. Visitors were only allowed for newborns. For patients who were dying, requests were evaluated case by case. I had to tell this granddaughter that although she had driven an hour and a half to say goodbye to her grandmother, that she wasn't going to be able to go upstairs. And all I could think about was what if someone had told me that when my mom was dying in hospice, if someone had told me that I couldn't see someone I loved because of this stupid fucking virus. It just completely broke my heart. But there were beautiful moments too like the dad in the neonatal ICU about to take his baby home. And the look on this dad's face as he showed me this picture of his daughter who had been born 16 weeks premature. And just the contrast between this little, little tiny being being extubated and hopefully being thrust into the world as so many people are being intubated. Her official first day as a doctor kept getting pushed back. When it finally arrived, she set aside a pair of scrubs 
She packed a lunch. She cleared out a small area of her apartment, which would become her decontamination zone. She walked into the hospital wearing a stethoscope. As soon as she got there, one of her senior residents pointed to it and told her she wouldn't be needing it. She wouldn't be seeing any of her patients in person. So when I was like a little bit embarrassed, like I felt like, you know, the noob who was being over eager, but also it was kind of like a devastating realization of, wow, the medicine being practiced right now is a different medicine than what I was used to. Initially, she wasn't going to be assigned to a coronavirus unit, but then it turned out the whole hospital was a coronavirus unit. Her colleagues were tired, brusque. Everyone was in survival mode. Much of her work was administrative, making phone calls, putting in orders. She missed the way that she had learned to practice medicine in school, when she'd check in on her patients, chat with them, apologize for waking them up at 6.45 in the morning. But when there's this huge disconnect, and I'm staying in the call room for most of the day, and I'm just getting texts about what to do, and it's, I, I feel like I'm floating in the dark. It went on like this for a while, until one day, Allison was asked to go see a coronavirus patient whose blood pressure was dropping in person. Allison went into the room. She rechecked the vitals, did an exam, and ordered labs. It was kind of a scary, like, oh my gosh, I'm the doctor here moment. People are looking at me and asking me what to do, and like, oh my gosh. Eventually, she realized that the patient was bleeding and needed to be transferred to the ICU. I didn't get it all by myself. I had this resident kind of coaching me along the way, but like, I'm kind of proud of myself. Like, I, I did it. The person's still alive. A few weeks ago, I called Allison to see how she was doing. She had just finished a shift at the hospital and I would start one the next morning. In San Francisco, we were seeing an uptick in cases and keeping our N95 masks in paper bags in case we needed to reuse them. But it was nothing like the chaos of New York. Allison was tired, but for her, this is just the beginning not only of her experience as a doctor, but as a doctor in the time of coronavirus. She's sure the pandemic will change everything, though she's not sure how. And while the work is long and hard, she is seeing just how rewarding it can be. Like when a few bars of a certain song are played over the hospital intercom. All you hear is, don't stop believing, hold on to that feeling. And they just do that bit, and then they fade out. <laughs> no explanation, which was why the first time I thought it was, I thought someone was just like having a, a bit of a joke with the hospital. But then it came on again, and eventually I figured out what it was for. When Allison asked about the song, her colleagues told her, the hospital staff plays it whenever a patient is released from the ICU.
Friday night lights typically shine on high school football players in Texas. But if you head south on Highway 281 to Edinburgh North High School, you'll find a different kind of team. Varsity Mariachi. Mariachi Oro is just three days away from their biggest competition of the year. As one of the top ranked teams in Texas, their coach is expecting perfection. Mariachi Oro, you can start your performance for the 2020 UIL State Mariachi Festival. That's not together. That's not together. You need to watch. That's not together. Violins and trumpets are not together at all. I'm Evo Acuña. I'm the mariachi director here at Edinburgh North High School, uh, my 10th year teaching, and um, I love mariachi. Yes, I was born and raised here in Edinburgh, so mariachi did not become a class, an actual full class in, at, here at Edinburgh North High School until about 14 years after I graduated high school. Even before I, I, was, I was a director here, the students have placed towards the top at state competition. I've been very, very fortunate that we do have two state championships. What the heck was that? Does anybody know what that was? Nobody knows? The trumpets, the trumpet section was, was late. Oh, yeah. Focus guys, focus please, count, focus. Edinburgh sits just 20 miles north of the Mexican border, in the middle of the Rio Grande Valley. People call this area El Valle. It's the heart of mariachi in Texas. Mariachi's popularity in Texas high schools has exploded in the past decade, but this is only the second year it's been sanctioned for state competition. Today, over half the students enrolled in Texas public schools are Hispanic. It's a big deal for an activity rooted in Mexican culture to get the same recognition as football, cheer, or marching band. Mariachi Oro has 11 seniors. There's Marifer, the group leader, Denise, an aspiring neuroscientist with a big voice, and Nathan, a second-generation mariachi who's been playing violin for nearly his entire life. How many years did you have I was about to be two years old in that picture. I actually still had that suit up to like three years ago and my dad decided to sell it to someone else. It actually still fits. I started standing there when I was four with the violin. And I wouldn't play. I would just stand there and, you know, you know just fake it. Nathan grew up watching his dad play in Mariachi Manantiel de Salvación de Fernando Fernandez, a well-known group in Edinburgh his dad founded 34 years ago. And he was always my inspiration, you know, my, you know, the person to follow. He got a heart attack the August 8th, and that was on a Thursday night. And that night, I told him, Dad, I am never gonna fill up your shoes, you know? And he told me, well, you don't have to right now, you know, it's a, it's a process and everything, so. Nathan's dad just passed away uh, about a month ago. You know, when that happened, you know, Nathan, he had to be the one that's earning the money and taking care of his dad's group. My whole life has revolved around mariachi and my whole life is gonna revolve around mariachi. <laughs> mariachi has been around since at least the mid 19th century. It's usually played on special occasions, from baptisms to quinceañeras to weddings and funerals. But most Americans associate it with Mexican restaurants. You know, those guys who wear the full charro outfits going from table to table playing songs? Mariachis call that working al talón, which literally means on your heels.
I do it with my friends, we go and hang out. We get the money and we have a nice dinner after. We use it as a learning experience, as a hangout, as a guy's night out, you know, and stuff. So that's basically what it is, looking for work. El Talon. What were you doing when I called you? I was doing homework. I still gotta do homework when I get back. Okay. How much do you have? 60. I figured she's I'm gonna take this because you didn't know half of the songs that we were playing. Historically, mariachi has been dominated by men. But that's changing. Women make up about half of mariachi oro. Denise and Marifed both started playing violin in middle school and joined the varsity team as freshmen. Now as they plan for life after high school, they're hoping to pursue a career that involves music. I really want to either get into UC Berkeley or Baylor because of their research facilities. Um, my major would be neuroscience on how music influences the brain but the problem is that their tuition's about 55,000 on top of bills and that stuff. I don't want to put that burden on my parents. So I'm trying to get scholarships. Right now I'm working on, it's called uh, Nuestra Cultura Scholarship. It's a mariachi scholarship and I'm halfway done. I just need two letters of recommendation and I'm just getting those. Hey Hector, I'm outside. In February, the moment Mariachi Oro had spent all year preparing for finally arrived. Over 80 teams descended on Edinburgh to compete in the State Mariachi Festival. Each team wears a traditional uniform called a traje de charro. Fitted pants, a short jacket, and a wide brim sombrero. But the girls put their own spin on it. Since it's very male dominated, we have to show men that girls can do it as well. We have to sing like we're men. <laughs> we have to uh, put our hair in a ponytail to like mimic that male hairdo. To make it more female, we put a hair bow. We have to get out of that a thing of, it's just for males. All right, guys, so don't forget, what are the three words that define Edinburgh North Mariachi? Pride, pride honor, legacy. legacy. Play with pride to honor the members before you and leave a legacy for the members after you. Always go over there and kick some butt. The next mariachi in Conference 6A is the Edinburgh North High School Mariachi Oro, the ENHS. Me daré otro tanto, no vaya a ser que algún día el gusto se vuelva 
Which is fascinating. What? Hmm. Ah. Okay. Great start. Yeah, love it. Please keep that in. <laughs> Shit. Cats and funny hats. <laughs> Cats and funny hats. Cat. Are you ready? Everyone ready? Sorry, that was really loud. <laughs> okay, have a great weekend. Just barely fits on that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> ah.